Hello, brothers of the internet. Welcome to the NBS show. I am Silver Quill, and if I knew you were coming, I'd have baked a cake, and you would have died from how terrible it was. But here on this podcast of insanity, I am joined by Norman Sanzo. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the ultimate cooking challenge, which is... No, wait, that's the wrong show. Hey, guys, what are you guys doing? We're saying hello, just as we're saying hello to Sapphire Hot Song. Hello there. I actually made a good cake because I actually know how to cook, unlike these two imbeciles. So, yeah, award me the blue ribbon for the best baked pie or something. I don't know. Can you share said cake with our audience? Sure. Oh, wait. Okay. They're behind okay. the screen. I can't. Disqualified. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> well, can you? I don't have a cake to share. Miss, I'm well, you would kill by everyone anyway. Oh, well, moving on. Exactly. Exactly. And if you can't tell from our culinary conversation, we are talking about a comic that involves baking a cake. Are we talking about Miss Forever issue one where Applejack and Pinkie Pie are baking stuff? Oh, we've been there and it was a dark and cold place. We're hoping this culinary foyer is uh, a little more uh, palatable. That's the right word for it, palatable. All right. Uh... Unlike issue one, issue number 22 of the Friends Forever line, written by Christina Rice, art by Jay Foskett, and colors by Heather Breckel. So, before we dive hip deep into spoilers, a general overview. Princess Celestia has summoned Twilight and Pinkie Pie to help get ready for Luna's birthday. She's only a thousand and five years old, wink, wink, and Pinkie is tasked with creating the perfect cake for Luna, with very little input from our Princess of the Sun. So, before we tackle the spoiler aspect, before we go through this, I think scene by scene works all right with this group. Yep. Oh, yeah. We're going to go with general views. And because uh one want to give another shout out to our friend James, who's taking a little respite, hoping he's recharging and feeling uh, stronger. So, normally we do inverted alphabetical order, but I, having usurped the show, yeah, ah, ah, decided we're going to do whatever the heck I want. So, Sapphire. Thoughts commence. Wait, isn't this going into inverted alphabetical order anyway? We're doing what I want. If what I want happens to go with inverted alphabetical, then okay, fine. It, so it shall be. This cake, this this cake of a comic. Oi, I want to see more Celestia, and in a way, Celestia has sort of gained her own stereotype throughout the years, and. The stereotype here is that she wants nothing more than for her sister to forgive her in this case. And we see that all over this comic with the cake that she wanted. At this point, from fanon interpretation to the show's interpretation, all we get from Celestia nowadays is her regret towards Luna. And that's, in a way, has sort of become the stereotype. The comic itself, it it seemed a bit too predictable in my opinion, overall. Overall? Already? Now, going with what, uh, again, just going with the order on the side, Sapphire. <laughs> Counter Sapphire. <laughs> this comic was the best thing ever because Beatles reference and the fact that Celestia is best princess. This is the best comic ever. Well done. Norman, can you top that? I don't know if I can, but I'll give my first impressions. Honestly speaking, I got no idea what's going on. I read the comic a few times, and I still got no idea what it wanted to say. I'm not sure it's a bad, good, but honestly speaking, what was I even reading? You're reading because you know a podcast is counting on you, that you are summoned to comment on it. That, and also, I do understand that Celestia wants a cake for Luna's birthday. The best baker around would be Pinkie Pie because she's the party animal. She knows how to bake cakes and whatnot. And we do have a lot of other cakes, like to Crooked, the Psychedelic, like all those cakes are really awesome, but the ending threw me for a loop because I got no idea what it wanted or what it was trying to say. So, I would just say that I'm confused and still am. Well, there you go. And now for me, because, and see, we're not out inverted alphabetical order because I'm going last. Yeah, ah, 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 ah. But this comic, it's, story-wise, it's pretty harmless. It is Celestia being kind of worried. It's the, it's one of the few times we get to see Celestia be nervous, which is actually kind of fun to see. It's allowing us a little bit more of a three-dimensional personality for her. 
Uh, unfortunately, it's very underplayed. A lot of the focus is on Pinky's frustrations and uncertainty herself. Ultimately, the story is almost quickly forgotten. It's not like a big impact or a huge insight into the characters. And infamy for several choices by uh, Jay Foskett. Oh. Which we'll talk about in depth, I think. But right now, it is one of the sheer bizarre ways that he can draw ponies and poses. And two, the fact that he used clip art from the internet on some of the ponies. Which to many people is, has become a cardinal sin. Oh, yes. Oh, the fact that Sapphire does not know this means I can initiate her. And I can... Oh, we, joy. We where, can get her... Where? I must be, I must be hopping mad. I must be hopping mad like Judy hops. Tell me, tell me where is this clip art that I must shine? Maybe we should review true and Silver can point it out when we reach there. Yes, yeah, say that best. We will build a sense of tension. So, be warned, all who enter here. We are entering spoiler territory, unless you want to be spoiled and eat of the cake of bitterness. You best turn back now and eat from the cake of I'll see you later. Okay? Okay, we're good. There's a lot of cake references today. I'm getting kind of hungry. Oh, man, I want cake now. God dang it. Let them eat cake. We open this comic with the train, chuka 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 chugaing. And I say that because it's actually in the uh, in the comic. It's been a long time since I've seen chuka chuka as a sound effect. Well, remember the episode where Sluttish I wanted to feed Philomena soup? Oh, well, mostly I wanted to feed Philomena cyanide. (laughs) That was like five years ago, Norman. You should know better. Little psycho bird. But Pinkie Pie is, for a very rare time, actually nervous. She's like me when people of high importance summon me. It's like, oh, God, what do they want? Am I in trouble? Oh, God. That's me on a daily basis. The funny thing is she's taken a page from Twilight's book is she's afraid of banishment. Everyone assumes that when Celestia calls them, they've done something wrong. She's like the principal. Oh, God, she's Principal Celestia. <laughs> Yay! But when they have the first thought of, oh, God, am I in trouble, does it mean that they did something wrong that Celestia might be not happy with them? In truth, I think it just means that they are in trouble because Celestia needs something from them, and that usually means Equestria is in danger. So true. And she's all like, well, I would totally help you with this, but I've got a hoof of cure at 10. <laughs> oh, God, no. But anywho, now is the time where they actually get to Canterlot, where they bow before the princess of unimaginable proportions. So this is the first thing we start with, Jay Foskett's art style. He's drawn a lot of criticism for the way he depicts ponies. They are chipified in a way, sort of Generation 3.5. Huge heads small bodies, and often very human poses relying on their hind hooves. I remember when I first started on the show and whatnot, when I saw Jay Foskett's art for the first time, because I'm not a regular comic book reader. I remember thinking, wait, are Rainbow Dash and Fluttershy Phillies, like during the uh, one comic, was, what was it, number 18, 19? Mm, I think 19, something around there. Something like that. Yeah, I remember thinking... Are they fillies? Because of the huge heads and tiny bodies. I thought they were young kids, but I was clearly wrong. J Force get gotten a lot of slack because of that, but to me this is one of the art style of many artists. For example, uh Assassin Monkey, if you take a look see at his artwork, you see that well, it's chibi, it's cute, uh the artist has his own style. So if you don't like it, you don't like it. You like it, you like it. To me, with Fosgit's style of work here, it's kind of cute. Takes time to get used to, but I do like it. It's very cute. Except for that one last panel in the page where Pinkie Pie blows up the party cannon. That scene where Celestia's sitting down, to me, that looks like a fursuiter. Nothing bad with that, but it's just like, what? Well, here's the thing. This comic in particular drew criticism because this was the first time Foskett drew Celestia, who in my eyes is the most complicated character to draw in the show. That ever-flowing mane is is trouble enough on its own, but then add in jewelry details, the fact that she has no other body type that matches her own except maybe Queen Chrysalis. You know, add some holes. No, not even Twilight has Celestia's size. The only closest that we can say is Nightmare Moon. Here's Celestia sitting. Again, here's that human posing. Well, with the ponies with their shorter legs, it works. Celestia has such long legs. 
it doesn't. Let's see here. Just as Norman pointed out the scene with the party cannon, on the next page where Celeste is leaning in and explaining, Pinkie Pie, I'd like you to make the cake for Lewis party. She's leaning forward, and from what I can tell, that looks like her hind leg with her front leg crossed over it. But the angle implies that it's both of her front legs, in which case the right front leg is contorting and is broken. Normally, in a human, if we were to interpret this as human, this would be Celestia kneeling on one leg talking to Pinkie Pie, and her left arm is just resting on the left right elbow. So She's still broken. Broken! <laughs> <laughs> But these are not humans, and I think it's important to try that point home. The ponies do take on human poses in this show. Once upon a time, Lyra sitting like a human was a unique, quirky uh, event. Now, a lot of ponies do that. They have chairs. They've crawled on their non-existent knees. They've shrunk. So the biology is by no means absolute. But they're still ponies. They still do horsey things. I think it's best that we take each certain situation with a pinch of salt because most of them won't do human-like actions all the time. So when we catch those things, it'll be like, eh, well, they're doing that. Okay, that's cool. For example, the Lyra sitting thing or Rainbow Dash on her knees begging for uh, a carrier link's things. Okay, wow, dude, you just got like five shades of slash fiction right there. Oh, it's on Fimfic. Oh, God, why am I not surprised? It just looks weird. That's what it comes down to. Every now and again, the art style can trip you up and be like, whoa, that's weird. We've not yet reached the most bizarre contortion for Celestia. But Pinky tries multiple designs. Like, did she, did she have these cakes, like, in her fifth pocket? Probably, the fourth dimension pocket. I like the second cake, but Celestia disapproves because nobody wants to be... Reminded of the place they were stuck in, even though she sees it every night when she has to lower the sun and bring up the moon. You know, symbolism. Still. And then there was the Sherpumpel. Sherpumpel? The Sherpumpel. A multi-layer cake of cherry, pumpkin, and apple pie. Huh. Baked into spice, yellow, and white cakes, of course. Sounds nice. And then Celestia says, that might be a little on the heavy side. Which, yeah, I'd agree. The fact that she has not had a heart attack by, at this young age is a minor miracle. Pinkie Pie, the gods of sugar are watching out for you, but beware the high fructose corn syrup demons. Yes, the high fructose corn syrup demons are just bad. They're not good for you. They're bad to the bone. Nah, 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 nah. Nah. Hey, you stole my reference from the last episode. <laughs> All's fair in love and references. And then we hit the lament of just about any creative designer or baker, basically anyone who has to create something for someone else. They want something kind of vaguely, something exciting, fun, and grand. Get elegant and befitting equestrian royal. Great. That really narrows the field. Thank you for that marvelous input. But this is, in many ways, a rare time where we've seen Celestia be indecisive. And that's a pretty rare event. It's something nice to see in truth, because this seems very low stakes. Celestia isn't going to risk a war. She's not going to lose the kingdom if she can't bake the right cake. It's a lower stakes, but it's more personality. Well, you could say it's character building. When it comes to her sister, she cares a lot until she doesn't know what's the right decision. She keeps on thinking that, oh, I don't want to hurt feelings. I want her to... Forgive me, I want her to love me, and I don't want her to be reminded of her banishment to the moon. Oh, I'm angry at myself because I banished her to the moon. That's what I'm getting here. If I can relate to this to my commission experience, I hate it when people, like, give me vague details, because then I always have to come back asking for questions. I've never had an experience to where I had to get a commission from someone I respected and admired or whatever, but this would be frustrating. Even though it's at low stakes, it's still on a personal level, of course, but it's like you don't want to disappoint people, and you go crazy because you're trying to find that perfect mix that you just can't figure out, and it's frustrating. 
and considering Pinky is sort of on a deadline, that makes the stress even more drastic. The stress is more stressful. The stress will kill us all, huh? Put away for the stress! Well, I'm, I'm trying to not be as repetitive, so I just said drastic instead of even more stressful than stress itself. Stress upon stress. And thus we come to the royal kitchen. And Chef Chase, who will be a minor figure in this comic, but more he again is a, is a conversation piece for uh, Foskett's art style. Multiple ponies in this are just drawn without any manes whatsoever. In fact, his entire kitchen staff appears to be maneless. Well, you need to tie up your hair and make sure that no hair goes into the food. But there is no hair. See? No hair in food. Problem solved. Well, there's the tails. What? Are they supposed to be in hair nets? My logic to reason is they shave it off so no mane will go into the food. But, well, <laughs> that could be me just defending Foskett here. In all reality, he could be lazy. Well, By the way, th- am I supposed to see any clip art yet? Funny you should mention that. But just before then, there's one other thing I'd like to point out. What can you say about his, the kitchen staff other than the, the baldness or shaven manes? They wear glasses? Wanda, I don't think, do. I don't think he's talking about, like, their looks. No cutie marks? Well, there's a cutie mark. The chef has a cutie mark. Oh, okay. They seem a bit more mentorish towards Pinky. Like, the one blue bald pony that I don't think has a name. Uh... Chef Chase. Okay, Chase. Oh, yay. Human name. Which I'm sure is a reference to the real world, but I don't know it. He seems a bit mentorish. Like, it seems that Pinky knows Chef Chase in a way, but we have have yet to see something like this in the show. Or whatever. I, I like him as a character, even though he has no impact in the story, if anything. I don't know. Well, the one thing I wanted to point out is that they are all Earth ponies. Mm. Now, we're Earth in... ponies are the best bakers. Oh, true that. Oh, well, that's that's just racist. Oh, come on. You see Applejack. You see you see these guys. You see Pinky. You see the cakes. Then again, there's also the Griffin, uh, Gustav, and uh, Pony Joe, who's a unicorn. So I guess it's not all... Well, when you're dealing with the best of the best, Celestia knows how to pick them. But jumping ahead a little here, all background characters are Earth ponies in Canterlot, which is primarily a unicorn city. And that's a minor thing, may sound like a nitpick, but ultimately I think what people really come down on Foskett for is that his backgrounds and worlds lack a certain diversity. So the comic feels more artificial. It's like putting forth the bare minimum of effort. Now, to the clip art accusation. There is a panel where Chase says, you can use the station in the corner, and you'll have full access to, and he points towards the pantry. There's sort of a triangular section that highlights Chase's cutie mark. That is clip art of a wisp taken from Google Image Search. Oh my god, I see it, and why? And this caused such a stir amongst people. Just, just, why? Well, we'll tackle that in a moment, because there's going to be an even closer look at it. So, get your thoughts in order on that one, but we'll move forward. Because we are about to enter the most psychedelic baking montage you will ever see. For Celestia has a fully stocked pantry, and Pinky's going great guns until Celestia herself shows up. And she just sort of stares. At Pinky. And is everything stay. okay? Is everything alright? How's it all going, Pinky? This situation reminds me of when you're playing a video game and you're having that awesome combo that you're doing until suddenly someone watches you and you drop that combo. <laughs> ah, there you go. <laughs> this is that in a nutshell. And so Celestia, again, seems uncharacteristically nervous. Even Chase... Uh, comments, she almost never comes to the kitchen. And there's a green pony with a mane there to poke holes in Norman's bald, shaven mane. Sorry, Norman. Yeah, but that's a female pony, a mare. Look at the snout. Are you sure? Oh, look at Chase's snout. Uh, Jeff Foskett, your art is confusing! 
And plus, there's no eyelashes. <sighs> but then we enter a t- the greatest two-page spread in the comic. Perhaps one of these. All right. Time to sound off. Favorite cake. Go. Uh, too many. Uh, two Twilight. All right. Norman picks two Twilight. Sapphire. I'll pick too creepy because I like that. I'm not I'm not keyframe, so I can't pick too psychedelic. So I'll just pick too creepy because oh my, I like it. I would go with too creepy as well, but I think it's up for competition because that uh, Jack in the Box in, <laughs> in the upper right corner, that's pretty creepy right there. I know. Too young. <laughs> to me, that was creepy. Like what the hey? I think it's because it's at a higher angle, so it's looking down on everything. You have that thing staring down at you. You are terrified beyond reason. Oh, yeah. I just like too many uh, too Twilight because it looks good. If that's an actual cake, and she managed to arrange it. Because from there, I think in a moment of weakness, she just stacked books and called it a cake. <laughs> okay. Now that you say it that way, like okay, uh, no then. It's just a moment of weakness. <laughs> but yeah, this, this is an amazing spread. Literally. And I think any one of these cakes would win an award. But Pinky, uh, Pinky's having a bit of a breakdown until Celestia comes in and sees Pinky once again talking to Madame Flower and Mr. Turnip. I don't remember Mr. Turnip. Is he new? Oh wait, no, he isn't. Yeah, they were in the bucket. And so Celestia just comes in and says, are you okay? And Pinky's just apologizing. And in the creepiest panel, Celestia leans in and apologizes, but that, their poses scream, I need an adult. <laughs> yeah. But I am an adult. Like... Oh, you're an Appa. <laughs> Silver, hide me. Save me. I don't, you're I don't the oldest one here. I'm the youngest. Save me. I, I don't think anyone can save you from Napa, Norman. <laughs> 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 But yeah, Celestia ha- is trying to be sincere and, and kind, but the way she's sort of towering and leaning over Pinky, it looks scary. Especially the um long, like, yes, this is all my fault, that panel. Mm. It, it seems weird the way that Celestia has been overlapped hair-wise. It's just... She's a floating head. Yes, even though you can see, like, part of her wings, it's just... There's no neck. The hair is blocking. Well, yeah, the hair is blocking, but it makes her look like a, uh, in a way, like the Cheshire Cats, if that makes any sense. Honestly speaking, I do understand why he did this. In terms of artistic decision, he did this because it was a shortcut not to draw the body. I would do this too if I were in his shoes. Well, that is one element that I I'd like to talk about that people didn't really seem to consider. This, this is where we get into the a, the whisk clip art. I get the sense that many of the cutie marks, just looking at Pinky, are vector artwork or stock images that are copy-pasted. It's not always easy to draw, and if you're working under a... I'm guessing you're facing multiple deadlines at once. I think there's a certain schedule of how things are done when talking to Heather way back when, but I don't remember what's the deadline like. I can't really resent him for using a quick bit of artwork for a background character. It does. It speaks that he's in a rush. And when you're in a rush, your work suffers. But when people immediately start assigning, oh, he doesn't care, this is just a job, it's a joke, well, maybe it is. But why are you taking it so personally? Maybe people like that, or people who commented like that, are invested in the comic, like how we are. But me, you, Sefi, we're kind of invested in terms of, hey, we're artists. We know how things are done. We understand that if people are on a deadline, we kind of cheat. Like cheat and steal is a method of living. It's bad, but it's not good. With Fosgit here and his art style, in terms of, okay, I want to cover things so I can do shortcuts and deal with Celestia's mean ingredients that would cover her neck and body proportions, that's what I'm seeing here. That he does that a lot. But he does come back with strange body proportions with that last panel we mentioned about Pinkie Pie needing an adult. <laughs> and then there's this line from Celestia. We talk so much about the, the, the art, but here's the writing. I was so worried about making things impossibly perfect, it didn't occur to me that I was placing expectations on you that couldn't be met. I mean, 
I demand all this to Twilight all the time, and she's only suffered ten nervous breakdowns. Celestia has a has a habit of placing of driving ponies to the brink of insanity. Uh, well, that's Celestia. That's Celestia. And then we come to what I consider the ultimate in what the hey proportions. Let's see here. It is the page where Celestia is saying, I'm the one who put her there. To talk about Moose Banishment. Oh. You see the three chef ponies carrying a whopper of, of, of a sandwich in the background. I see. And Pinky, for some reason, never thought that putting your sister in the moon would be a bad thing. Really? How does no one empathize with Celestia over this? Because they never had to stick their sister into the moon, that's why. I think you could imagine the horror. But look at the way Celestia is sitting. Oh, yeah. Okay, this one, I got no defense. I was trying to ponder and think of how in Celestia's name is she doing that? Well, I, I actually can. It took a little imagining, but I think I know which leg is supposed to go where. <laughs> but again, the the flowing mane makes it look like her neck is a pencil. So, left foot green, right foot red. Are you, are you, right. are you kidding? Celestia would find the plaid in Twister. She would, <laughs> she would manage to nail the spot that never existed. <laughs> Ay, ay, ay. Look at her wings, too. I mean, uh, they're huge. I mean, they look sort of like they're melting. Like her wings are witches and have just had water poured all over. Or cement, in a way, that hasn't been quite dried up yet. I know people compare Principal Celestia to Bayonetta in terms of her legs, but I'm sure Princess Celestia doesn't have that comparison here. Come on. It's probably with the most bizarre sight in the comic. And they're just like, what? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I I agree with everyone when they complain about the art. When they point this one out, I got no defense. Like, they just look at her face. Like, there's no defending that. Like, where is her bottom jaw? I don't know. It's, just... it's, it's something to behold. I wish I could answer your questions, but I am lost and afraid. Hold me, Norman. As long as you're not afraid and naked, there is a show called... Naked and afraid. So. Oh, God, no. What, what you watch on your own time is your business. <laughs> I... True that. Okay, I have to say this because I have always been a defender of Jay Foskett. I always say that his art takes a lot of time to get used to. But once you get used to it, it's really cute and playful. He has that energy that other artists don't have. I like his art in the Rarity and Cheerly comic. I like his art in Rainbow Dash and Spitfire comic. And in this one, I don't feel that energy. I just don't know. I can't defend anything about this one. Like, If we want to talk energy, I think the next two pages would be more in line with what you enjoy about Foskett's work. Because now that Pinky knows what Celestia is really going for here, you know, accepting that something bad happened, but they're moving forward together. Now she knows what to really bake, which I guess was just the critical information she needed. So we get two pages of them baking together. And I, I will say, for all the confusing proportions, the scene of Celestia and Pinky hugging, I think that has some adorable nature to it. Yeah, it does. Although the batter that's kind of stuck on them doesn't really make any sense to me. It just feels like a dust cloud that was landed on top of them. It doesn't, like, feel it's on them. Like, Celestia's mane and tail, like... Well, that's just a case of unintentional batter. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know, I know, but still, with, like, that big lump, it feels unrealistic in a way. Oh, wait, ma maybe Madame Lafleur wanted to get in on the hug. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll stick with that. But here's the thing, this is what I like. Like, this two-page where the both of them are baking. This is the energy that I know Foskid can do. This is what I expect of him. And that uh, tender moment there is the icing on the cake. No pun intended. Oh, take it. Take the pun. Intend the pun. <laughs> oh, the pun. Oh, the pun. And so we come to Luna's birthday party. And lo and behold, it's an audience of Earth Pony. See, this is what I'm talking about. Not a unicorn in the house. Oh, Pegasi. Probably there's a Pegasi one or two in the background. Far in the no. background. Although there is that one weird looking, actually no, two weird looking background ponies. <laughs> Three, four. I'm I assuming just two. 
again, I'm I get the sense that I'm looking at a culture reference and I don't get the culture. Same. <laughs> or the reference. But uh Twilight gives some well researched uh speech that none of us hear. And there is the cake. Celestia and Luna uh cutie marks upon a cake with and it's marble pie. Wait, no, mm. not marble. You baked marble? Oh you monster. <laughs> Oh no. Eh, I won't miss her that much. And Luna is driven to tears by how wonderful this cake is. And somehow this cake represents that they put the past behind them. So they have a, a wing hug. I, I don't get it. <laughs> oh, oh, thank God. I'm not the only one. It's, it's a weird declaration. It's like the party as a whole could represent this. And the cake can be a part of that party. But somehow this cake is an expression of their reconciliation. I don't get it. I mean, it's a cute moment, and I like the concept that Luna, even today, just wanted to be viewed as an equal, like in this case. But I don't see that with this. And where's the marble? It's just plain blue. Thank God, because I thought I was the only one who's not getting it. I've read this a few times just to get the ending, but I just don't get it. There's no mention... That would sort of foreshadow this, if that makes any sense? No, I think it's always been mentioned before about how Celestia wants to make things right. Like, she wants to get on Luna's good side because she banished her to the moon 1,000 years ago, blah, blah, blah. But the way that it ended here, it's just like, what am I even reading? This is just really confusing. Silver, chime in, man. Like, I have, I have nothing to add, I mean... It's, I, like I say, the party itself can be an expression of love. That is Pinky's character in a nutshell. She shows her love for others by helping them celebrate moments in life. That is her strongest trait. That's why she's such a great party planner. She knows this isn't just a party, it's something you'll look back on. But it's to say that a piece of cake is somehow an expression of working together in mutual forgiveness, respect, is like, uh, I don't know. The ice scene's not that good. <laughs> Here's the scene where it gets confusing. Pinkie Pie cuts cake, offers it to Luna. In the same panel where she offers it to Luna, Celestia's face goes into one of those scared moments. We go to the next page. Luna looks at cake and she tears up and hugs Celestia and talks all that thing. What? What indeed. What indeed? There's no even mention of Celestia helping Pinkie Pie with the cake. There's no even, is, there's not even a scene where P Princess Luna eats the cake and one, in one of those Japanese cartoons goes, Oh my god, this is the most amazing cake. I can feel the love from Celestia. Oh, there's not even that. Okay, if she says Oishi, uh, <laughs> I, I'm leaving. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, Still, we don't even have that. You know what I mean? Uh, no, seriously, I can actually picture the pose. Oh, gee, they got a hand, <laughs> or, they got a hand or hoof on their cheek. It's just like, why does everyone take that pose? Is that the universal sign of yummy? I think so, in Japan. You know, it's really the climax is them baking the cake together. This is the resolution. But Luna's party was the, the focus. The driving impetus, the deadline. You'd think this would be the climax. Honestly, I got no idea where we, where it is. And we're at the end of the comic, by the way. And where's the punchline? There's no punchline. Usually when we review this, there's a punchline that we always do. But it's not here. Oh, there, there is. Pinky says, it's a piece of cake. Uh, <laughs> uh, ah. Okay, I can't help it. I love bad puns. <laughs> you, you and I will get along fabulously then. But also, just to drive home everyone's anger, there's that clip art for uh, Chase again. But compare that to Pinky's cutie mark in the same panel, and you realize they're both uh, copy-pasted artwork. Yeah. 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 This is my thing, but basically Twilight's wearing a mini Celestia crown. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A minor thing, but it's just sort of, ah, this is the thing. Jay Foss gets to sum it up. His artwork can be adorable. It takes him getting used to. But you also get a sense that he's hurrying himself through it. Whether by schedule or possibly disinterest, I don't know. But the audience, who is 
on the lookout for this sort of thing notices, and that impacts the overall enjoyment. True that. Honestly, on my end, when I read through the comic for the first time, I didn't see the whole um, clip art thing until I think James mentioned it to me and I took a look-see again. But still, it didn't hurt me that much because the overall theme for the comic, the overall story for the comic confused me. I got no idea what I was reading. And I think that's the problem with this comic. I got no idea what I was reading. To me, it's all a amalgam of what? A general what the hey? Indeed. And talking about Jay Foskett being not interested. Uh, issue 24. It's a real shame too. I mean, the comic itself had some potential in its story. But it didn't seem to pull through, like, with the art or the story. Like, at the end, it was confusing, it made no sense, and there was no purpose, like, in a way, for the ending, if you know what I mean. I know what you mean. There's no real point with this comic. What am I supposed to feel? Confused. Or hungry. Hungry for cake. Get the cake. The creepy cake. (laughs) But not that creepy cake, the other creepy cake. The one that looks like a dragon. Or stack stack some books and try to eat those. Hi, Twilight. <laughs> yeah. But overall, man, like I, I think I gave my final impression on the book. But what about you guys? Like, I, I, Did you guys dish out your final thoughts? Uh, Sapphire, what are your final thoughts? My final thoughts, huh? Oh, boy. I wish I could like this comic. I was very disappointed in this comic. I I love... uh, Pinky isn't my favorite character. Rarity's my favorite of the main six, but I love Celestia. And uh, it sort of has become a stereotype of her right about now. Of her nothing but deep regret towards Luna. I wish there was more to Celestia than we could come across when it comes to a character, but this comic, it didn't really do much with her character, and even then, it's not even really a Friends Forever comic. It's like a Rarity in the Cakes comic for me. Like, with Zakor and Spike, you could see them interact more throughout the majority of the comic, minus Spike kind of ditching Zakor at the end. You still get to see that characterization. I don't get that with Pinky and Celestia. It just wasn't a very good comic, in my opinion. And I want it to be. That's the frustrating part. Honestly, I mentioned a few of my gripes earlier on. But just looking at the comics, it had that tempo where, oh, this is going to be good. But when it reached near the middle to the near the end, it's like it lost focus on what it wanted to tell. Because I, as a person who read a lot of fan fiction can say that at least I do understand what they're trying to do and I quote-unquote may enjoy or may not enjoy it and I can leave it be. But for a product that I bought and read through, I am not happy with the purchase I made. Am I disappointed? Yes. Am I going to stop reading it? No, because I like the brand. I like the Friends Forever line because it has Diamond in the Rough. Honestly, this one with its artwork, was kind of lacking. It was lacking a lot of places, especially that one strange post that you said you could figure out while I can't. Like you mentioned before, like if Jay Fosgate was passionate or not, we can see that in issue 24 where, uh, I wish we can go to that comic now because ay ay ay, a lot of things that we can talk about there. Yeah, I'm just going to hold it off until we reach to that review because oh, much fun to be had. The hate is strong with this one. <laughs> Indeed. What about you, man? I like seeing a more vulnerable Celestia. I like seeing her nervous. She wanted this to go perfectly, but she was hovering. And it's very rare that Celestia is shown with sort of that good-natured error. Oftentimes, because when she screws up, the rest of the nation is put in danger. I mean, Chrysalis, Tyrek, you name it. This is the benefit of showing her uh, a little fallible, but not world-ending fallible. 
And so I enjoyed that. as It did show how much Pinky puts effort into making the perfect cake and wanting people to be happy with her creations. She understands that there's meaning behind this, not just a cake. That said, a cake cannot convey a thousand years worth of forgiveness and reconciliation. So I'm with you guys that Luna being driven to tears and somehow this cake is supposed to make everything better. The cake is a piece of a larger puzzle. And it's one thing if Pinky wants to be a part of the overall thing, but at the end, the comic sort of reduces the focus to just that. Hey, Chef Chase, the other food is nice, but this cake, oh, this cake. And then there is the drama around Jay Foskett, which in truth, I think, reflected more negatively on the fandom and how eager we are, we've become to pounce on every mistake and to declare, oh, this is awful because of it. He used clip art and his style takes some getting used to. You say those, you say you don't like it. Okay, but is that the end? That's, Not really. Yeah, that's that's the thing. So many people, that one element d- d- blocks anything else. And I'd encourage people just to say, okay, I don't really like this element, but what else is there in the comic to counteract it? Because at, then, at least then you can break even. Yeah, true that. And like I mentioned before, when you pay for something, like for me, I paid about, three, four bucks for the comic. I feel, well, I won't say I feel entitled, but I feel betrayed when ripped off. the creator, yes, rip off. I feel rip off when the creator or the artist didn't give it their all. I mean, even with the quote unquote, a uh, Wild West arc, the hate was strong with that one, but still I enjoyed the art. The art was not bad. James would say otherwise, but to me, I find that art Good, I like the comic art. That's about it. Well, with the comic, you need good story writing, good storytelling, and good art is the thing. Not just one or the other. Because if you have good storytelling, okay, that's good. But if the art is mediocre at best, no one would want to read it, if you get what I mean. Yeah, you could say that for the episode as well, because... Uh, some people don't like certain episodes, like uh, The Mysterious Meridwell. The art was good, but the story was bad. Exactly. Vo- voice acting was still there, but... <laughs> it's a question of how much can the positives and the negatives weigh against one another. Sometimes there's no overcoming it. I don't think the art in this was so off-putting that it undermined the positives. It's just that positive-wise... In story, there wasn't as much to sustain it. We needed a new insight on both Pinky and Celestia to really make this go, oh, wow. There were certain character building for Celestia, but it was not enough for us to go, wow, crappy art, but I love the story. And once again, as I said before, it's a bit of a Celestia stereotype now that it's nothing but regret towards what she did to her sister. True, I don't know. I mean, that trope is getting old. But here's something I can give you all a a nice read when it comes to fanfiction. If you do enjoy the Celestias, I would recommend you guys go reading a fanfic on Fimfic called Sunny Skies All Day Long. That is a very, that is a very good portrayal of Celestia. I won't spoil the story, but if you guys have the time, go read it because it's fun. It's really, really fun. Alrighty. Well, thank you for the recommendation. For now, I think we've said all we can say about uh, about this comic. So, looking to the future, we are on the cusp of Season 6. Yeah, honestly, Silver, I think when this episode comes out, Episode 1 and 2 has already been shown. Okay, well then, maybe we should... Uh, let me revise that ending. Then. No problem. Uh, like you, We can just roll with it. What, what are we going to review next, then, I guess is the real question. Oi, what? <laughs> you know, we usually don't tend to jump on the latest episodes because we like to give it time to breathe, give us time to process it and stuff. And I don't know, honestly, this is one where if we rush things, we might be out of friends forever. Like right now, the mainline comic, we're two issues uh, back. And with the friends forever, we're four issues back. So, I don't know, man. Like, what do we do? I say we go for the episode. 
I I like, agree. I, I think the episode makes a lot of sense. We're at that point. Maybe it is time to get a little breathing room. And besides, we have two weeks to get on the episode, and, like, even after all this is posted, we do this, like, within a two-week span, so by the time it comes out, we've had a week of preparation, at least. True that, true that. So I'm guessing that, well, next week you guys are going to catch a new episode review. We haven't done that in, what, three months now? Well, not as long a hiatus as I expected, but yeah, we're back in it. Back in the saddle again. Oh yeah. Let's go for it, baby. So join us next time as we talk about the season premiere. Oh yeah, expectations. Let's go hype and let's be really disappointed. I have low expectations. I got high expectations and I'm ready for them to be destroyed. Yay! I have very low expectations. Why? We are a cynical bunch. You know, after six years of ponies, nothing can surprise me. Oh, but what what happens when you find out that Celestia is really Twilight's mother? Dun, dun, dun. There was already a comic that Dr. Wolf dubbed <laughs> over the theory. <laughs> oh, this fandom, nothing surprised me anymore. See? What if you find out that Celestia is Twilight's mother's uncle's cousin's son's second roommate? Oh then I would God. call bull crap on that. <laughs> uh, but still, this is going to be awesome. Uh, I can't wait. We, we, sh- we shall see what the future holds. But in the meantime, well, we want to thank you for sitting with us and talking about this here comic. So, for the MBS show, I am Silver Quill. I am Norman Sanzo. Enjoy my cake. And I am Sapphire Hardsong, and I feel bad for cutting off Norman there. I can edit it out. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Fine. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and we'll see you later. We'll catch you guys. See ya. Bye-bye. Right on There's cue. no escaping. There's no escaping. There's no escaping. Never. Although we can't edit Sapphire out of that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs>